In December 1979, a young woman was walking along to the bus stop, carrying loads of bags full of presents for her loved ones. As she stood at the bus stop, I can only imagine her excitement for getting to spend the next few days with her family. When the bus showed up, Phyllis wasn't there. Philomena Murphy, who went by Phyllis, was born to parents Michael and Kathleen and was the third youngest of 10 children. So she had six sisters, Barbara, Claire, Patricia, Breda, Anne and Martina, and three brothers, Michael, Gerard and Patrick. Her father was originally from Enniscorthy, but he was an army man and so he was based in the Curra. So this is where he met local uh, Kathleen and they settled down in Rowanville in Kildare. Sadly, when Phyllis was only seven, her mother passed away at just 41 and her eldest sister, Barbara, took on the motherly figure then for her younger siblings. Phyllis went to the presentation convent in Kildare and after her intro cert, which is in today's world, uh, this junior cert, so you usually do that at like 15, 16, she began working. Uh, so she worked in a knitwear factory in Monasterevan. I think it could have also been Curra Knitwear, which is where she went to work then in Newbridge. So she was actually one of the cutters. So she, as far as I know, she done like, the, she done children's clothes, baby's clothes. And as far as I know, like she was the one who had like the template. So she cut out the other like templates to, to give out to like the staff. I think that's how it worked. From what I can gather, she really, she really enjoyed this work and got along with all the other girls there. Uh, Phyllis was described as quiet and shy. She was quite uh, like reserved and sensible, but full of life. She absolutely loved children, so she would be bringing her own nieces and nephews out for walks all the time. She would apparently like just knock into the neighbours to ask to bring like the baby out for a walk in the pram. When she was older then, she actually went to Lourdes um, to help, you know, how elderly and um, dis people with disabilities and stuff would go over to Lourdes. So, or, you know, terminally terminally ill and stuff so she went over with a trip to to help out with people all her family stayed local and um, even her eldest sister didn't didn't move that far away when she built her house and um, one sister Anne did move to Australia and another brother would later Jared would later move as well um, but at the time in 1979 there was just one sister living abroad Anne so as I said uh, Phyllis was quite sensible as she knew what she wanted you know in life she had actually been engaged to a lad but um, there's not a lot of information on him, like you don't get his name or anything like that. But apparently the engagement, they broke it off because he was more into like going, you know, going out on nights out and stuff where she is, she preferred to like have quiet nights in and stuff like that. Um, one source says that she had actually started to see someone in December 1979. Um, and then her sister in another source actually says that she had been debating, you know, whether to get back in touch with the lad that she had been engaged with. So... That could have been who who the new relationship w was with, you know. But as I say, there's not a lot of information on that. Um, and one of the things was, I think Phyllis was quite sensible like that when it did come to men or la lads or whatever. I, I feel like I kind of get the impression that she wouldn't take any crap kind of thing. Um, she also was a big believer in abstaining from sex before marriage. Uh, so she was she was very adamant that she would be a virgin up until her wedding. So in 1979, Phyllis was 23 years old. She was just over five foot. She had straight chestnut brown hair. So as she grew up in Rowanville, um, her next door neighbours were the Martins. And in 1969, the Martins actually moved to Newbridge. Um, just, it's just probably a silly thing, for, especially for people living in Ireland. There's like County Kildare and then Kildare, which means like Kildare Town. I never, I never understood that when I was younger. I remember saying to someone like, he's from Kildare and he was like I'm not I'm from Newbridge and I didn't understand it because to me you're just from Dublin you wouldn't you wouldn't assume Dublin means Dublin city centre but anyway so when I say Kildare we usually mean Kildare town and then obviously Newbridge Monastery or whatever and if I'm gonna mean the county of Kildare I'll try and remember to say the county of Kildare anyway the Martins moved to Newbridge and so after Phyllis started working in the uh, knitwear factory in Newbridge she stayed with them so uh, my impression is she stayed with them kind of like during the week and that she might have then went home like on the weekends or like that, you know, for kind of special occasions and stuff. 
And she also spent some time in Rathangan with the Martin's um, grandmother, you know, just as, an, as a companion kind of to keep her company. Phyllis spent the Friday 21st of December. She spent that night babysitting for her brother Gerard in Newbridge. And then the following morning then she went off on the Saturday to do some last minute Christmas shopping. Uh, she was wearing jeans and a grey coat. She actually bought herself a pair of new tan boots, you know, as a present for herself. And then she obviously was looking out for, you know, last few bits for her nieces and nephews and for her family. She then had a 12.30 appointment in Blake's hairdressers where she actually wanted to get, you know, like a new look. So she actually went with a pair, which would, you know, like, crazy a few people compare it uh, call it like afro like they're saying that she had afro she got an afro hair do or something uh but i suppose it's not really like a perm is a bit different but anyway she had a perm so delighted with her new look she had another bit of a look around the town and then went back to the martin's home for 4 p.m here she had a bath and a quick snack to eat and then she grabbed her overnight bag and all the, the bags with like the christmas presents and stuff in it and headed off so on her way to the bus stop, she dropped into her brother, Jared, who she had babysit for the last night, the night before. Um, and like she didn't stay long. So she just kind of popped in to say hello. I think she wished them a uh, Merry Christmas. So maybe they weren't going to actually spend Christmas Day, you know, together. But, uh, you know, she seemed to be excited and, you know, was talking about the, the days ahead. She was going to get the 6.50 p.m. bus from Newbridge to Kildare. Um, so she left Gerard's and then on the way to the bus stop she dropped into her friend Barbara Lucas so uh, they were actually planning to go out that night to a dance in Kildare um, but when she called in Barbara wasn't there Barbara would later say she thinks she actually went down to the town to like return you know to exchange something but her, her mother Margaret was there so she did have a chat with her for a few minutes obviously you know showed off her new hair they both chatted about what their plans were for Christmas and stuff like that and then Phyllis told Margaret or asked Margaret to tell Barbara that she would meet her at 9 p.m in Kildare Town for the CY dance um obviously back then you know it was more like there was it wasn't like clubs it was like discos and stuff like that or dance halls and um, so that was their Saturday night plans so at about 6 30 p.m then Margaret walked Phyllis to the gate um and watched her walk up the road of Ballymany Road and the bus stop was about 50 yards away and it was just slightly it was across from the Cadian hotel and then just slightly down a bit I'll put I'll put some pictures up um and so she obviously trundled along with all her bags and you know shopping it would have been a very dark cold miserable night by this point and um Phyllis had like her mittens you know she either had them on or or like you know was holding them but she had her uh, 610p pieces, coins, tucked into one of the mittens. And this was her 60p bus fare. But when the bus pulled up at 6.50pm, one passenger got off and no one got on. When Barbara Luker arrived into Kildare Town then at 9pm, uh, Phyllis wasn't there. And so this was unusual. A few people would say, you know, it wasn't in uh, Phyllis's behaviour or nature to just not show up or even to be late. So she actually went down to Phyllis's sister, Martina, who lived close by, just to kind of see, you know, maybe she was there or something like that. Um, immediately, people were, were concerned. As I said, uh, Barbara Turner, who would be Phyllis's eldest sister, obviously she got married then, uh, she would say, like, it, it wasn't like her. She just she wouldn't just not show up. She, she would at least, you know, let the person know that she wasn't going to come. She would make some way of telling them, and if not, she would be there. So immediately everyone is concerned because they're like, where's Phyllis? So obviously they checked uh, with the Martins and she wasn't there. They checked in with and she wasn't there. And obviously she wasn't at home in Rowanville. So obviously this is the night of the 22nd. So kind of going into, I don't know. I don't really know what happened that night. Maybe they were hoping like that she, she had just got delayed or something had happened. But by the following day on the 23rd, her brother Jared and a family friend, Michael Martin, went to the guard station to report her missing. Now, uh, I'll just say at this point, one of the books where, at uh, the one where no, uh, where no one can hear you scream, Phyllis's story is in that. And they very much make it seem like the Guardian didn't take it seriously. I think partly because of her age and because things like this didn't happen, you know, young girls didn't go missing, young girls weren't murdered. Um, 
But bear in mind, it was only eight years previously that in the following county of Mead, Unalinsky was abducted and murdered. So it wasn't completely unheard of. Um, but fine, that's, they just thought, you know, like, that doesn't happen. So, you know, she's obviously just got delayed somewhere. She's obviously, you know, w you know, like, like that, even like she's with a new boyfriend or something. They just didn't take it seriously. Now, this also is said in a radio interview with Barbara, her sister. Again, that the Gardaí weren't taking it seriously in the beginning. In uh, Barry Cummins' book, Lifers, uh, he also discusses how like they didn't even during the searches and stuff apparently uh they called they don't name the guard but they called into like a guard or something or a sergeant um when they were doing like door this is a family doing door-to-door -door inquiries and like he he was like she'll, she'll turn up and invited the person in for a drink like it was very much obviously then when things got more seriously like he would have joined in the search parties and stuff but very much in the beginning they just didn't they just didn't take it seriously now in the T.G. Cahar uh, documentary, uh, Maru, Maru in our ma in our mask, it means murder in our midst, uh, Oskelge, the, they make it seem like the guards from the get-go were involved and they were concerned and they were doing the searches and stuff, but all the other sources seem to not. Um, so I don't know. I I mean, I would lean towards just, you know, because that does happen, that the guardy, I mean, initially didn't think it was a serious thing. Now, so basically, the family started searching. Um, they convinced, like, the local radio or whatever to, to put out a notice that she was missing. They obviously called, you know, everyone they could possibly think of that she could be with. And again, she wasn't there. So the local radio put out the ad, the ad the notice, the missing persons notice on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day, the men of the family actually went out searching on the curra. So apparently they didn't want the women to go with them in case like that they were to find something. So they were all out searching and the women actually then kind of like done like that, the door to door inquiries uh, around the area of Newbridge and further on. Now, out of desperation, Barbara says that they went to a diviner and the diviner said that Phyllis was still alive and that she was in the old Kilcullen area which is another part of Kildare. So like that, they spread out to there. And you're like, Barbara said at one point, it was like 2 a.m. in the morning and she was knocking on people's doors with a photo of Phyllis. In the radio interview, Barbara says that members of the civil defence knew Phyllis from like work. They worked with her um, in the factory, which I don't really understand. But um, either way, they got involved. So like the civil defence was involved before the Gardaí were involved. The day after Phyllis disappeared, an elderly couple were driving to Mass when they came upon a fire on Lockstown Upper. It would later be examined and there was a button from Phyllis's jeans, um, like the metal catch from your bra and a part of her tweed coat. So obviously now the guardies, like ears were starting to prick up. Is that a saying? Um, the guardy anyway were, were starting to be a bit more... Mm, and then a boy came forward obviously the news got out about those pieces being found and then a boy came forward and said that on Christmas Eve he was on now most things say Colgan's Cut like C-O-L-G-A-N Colgan's Cut but in the documentary I'm pretty sure one of the detectives is saying Corrigan's now he could be saying Colgan's and just with the accent it sounds like Corrigan's but it definitely I so I'm not sure now I was actually, I'm trying to find, it's definitely, I think it is Colgan's Cut. Now, when I'm trying to find it on, like, uh, Google Maps or anything, I can't find that specific area. But it's a part of, like, the, the greater Curra. And so he says that he found a pair of tan boots and a child's cardigan one day on Christmas Eve. um, And, like, that he just brought them home with him. I don't know why. Obviously, I don't know, maybe he was going to give them to someone. And then on the 26th of December, so Stevens's day, there was a hunter out shooting game in Brannockstown and he came across Phyllis's overnight bag and like her bags with the Christmas presents in them. They had been thrown over a wall and like, uh, like bushes or branches or whatever were thrown over them to try conceal them. So now the Gardaí are concerned and a full scale investigation begins. At this point, it is supposed to be a missing persons uh, case but both the guardian and the family know that it's more serious they know something bad has happened it was a very harsh winter um barbara her sister would say like that she was going to bed at night you know and she'd be she'd be getting into her warm bed and she would just be thinking like 
where is where is Phyllis lying out in the cold? So obviously, like the Murphy family went like hell for leather with searching even before the Gardaí were bothering to do it. Um, as soon as they told Anne, the sister in Australia, without even telling them, she just booked a flight to come home to Ireland. When she got home, um, they just opened like the, and they opened the door to her. Everybody was obviously in such like a like in a focus mode of in, like investigation mode that they literally opened the door like she was Annabelle, like coming in to help. Uh, no one even acknowledged the fact that this was someone who just flew across the world to be there. So anyway, Anne was home. So that was them all home looking. Farmers within a 20 mile radius of Newbridge were asked to search their lands and their outhouses and stuff. The bus operator Conway's actually would um, give buses basically to like load people up and down for the searches and stuff. People even came from Dublin to search. So the search parties were basically like that. They were in Newbridge, they went out to the Curra, they went further out into Kildare and then into Wicklow up towards the Wicklow Mountains. Barbara says that they were getting closer to the Wicklow Mountains and then one day the bus just turned back. And she says to this day she still doesn't know who told them to turn back. But the reason it seems that they turned back was items were found on the curry. So the belt of Phyllis's coat and her mittens were found in the curry, again at Colgan's Cut. Now, the belt was hanging from like a bush or a branch or something, and the mittens were just clearly on the ground. And her bus fare was still in the little mitten. Now, her family are adamant that that stuff was not there. Um, because they said, obviously, they they searched all that. Before the guards even got involved, they searched it. And then, obviously, it was searched again when the guardian stuff got involved. So they don't understand how it could have been missed by them or by the other people. The fact that the belt was hanging, you know, it was hanging visibly. And the mittens were literally just out on, on the field, like, or on the, the ground, whatever, the muck. Um, they they are adamant that it wasn't there, so they they think someone put it there to throw off the scent from going towards the mountains. Now it could be that it just happened that people did miss it. You know, human error. People do miss things. Maybe that was it. But it is a thing that killers are known to keep items. So perhaps the killer knew that they were getting uh, closer, and to throw them off the scent, did use some of the items that they kept as decoys to, to bring them back to Newbridge. Eventually, the search did continue on towards uh, Wicklow Mountains. And on Friday, the 18th of January, just before noon, Phyllis was found. She was found near the Ballinagee Bridge on the Hollywood uh, to Glendalock Road. This is near the Wicklow Gap. Her naked body lay under some spruce trees and there had been like minimal effort to cover her up with um, like branches and stuff like that. So the guy he would actually later say that this showed the killer was in a hurry because because of how isolated the area was, he could have covered her more. He could have even gotten away with actually, most likely he could have gotten away with even burying her if he wanted to because the area was so, so isolated. It was almost sub-zero temperature, so her body was basically frozen. Gardy pulled into the Murphy home to tell them, just as it came on the radio. Her brothers, Jared and Michael, would go up to the scene to identify her. Um, Barbara says this is something they never got over. When they returned, um, the family asked if she was fully clothed, or, you know, if she was clothed, and they said she was. Um, until again the radio the news on the radio said that her body was found naked so the brothers were obviously trying to protect the rest of the family from this one you know this one detail and they didn't um, so that night Professor John Harbison the state pathologist performed the post-mortem there were six guardy in attendance and basically no one talked for the entire thing I'm going to put a warning um, here for the, the results so you can skip forward if you want to. I'll put a timestamp, sorry. She had 25 separate injuries, mainly to her face, neck and head. She had severe bruising to her eyes. She had a split lip and there was damage to her, to, damage to her jaw. There was also bruising on her chest. She had heavy bruising on her inner thighs, which um, indicated that she, they had been 
that they had been forced apart um, in the act of rape. There was also bruising on her arms to indicate that they had been held up against uh, above her head. She also had a lot of um, defence wounds on her to show that she fought back. After raping her, he strangled Phyllis, compressing her vagal nerves, causing her heart to stop. So she would have died quickly. Experienced detectives couldn't get over how battered she was. Professor Harbison was surprised by how well preserved her body was. He used 12 cotton swabs to collect samples from her body. These would later show there was semen present. They all kind of talk about how, you know, things kind of I don't know, happen at the right moment, this type of thing. So basically, the it was so cold that her body was, Phyllis's body was, you know, so preserved, which would help the case. Um, and shortly after she was found, it actually began to snow heavily, which was like a, a blanket of snow everywhere. And so they may not have found her if it had taken any longer. So it's just like it was that that right moment. Her family were actually quite relieved that they found her. Obviously, they were, you know, incredibly upset that she she had died. But Barbara talks about how, you know, it was the waiting and the not knowing that was worse. And at least now, you know, they, they knew where she was, you know, that she would then, you know, be buried with her mother and stuff like this. It was, you know, that they knew, you know, they knew where she was. They had her. The disappearance of Phyllis captured the attention of the nation. Um, women particularly in Kildare and Newbridge and stuff, were afraid, like they were afraid to go out on their own, especially at night. By the 7th of January, 3,000 residents had taken part in questionnaires by the Gardaí. This would have been about their movements and stuff on the night, this, this type of thing. The Gardaí and Phyllis's family believed that she must have been picked up by someone she knew. Uh, Barbara would talk about how, like, Phyllis, like that, she was sensible. She would not take a lift. She would never hitchhike, this type of thing. She'd never thumb a lift. Um, if her friends were going to do that, she would give them the money for the bus rather than, than let them do that. Like, she was very much against that. So to get into someone's vehicle, she would have had to have known them, have, have been comfortable with it. And they believed that she had to have willingly gone into a vehicle because there was no sign of a struggle at the bus stop. None of her, like that, none of her clothes, her bags, anything was found. Um, so they do believe that she got in willingly. Gardy believe that Phyllis was driven to Col Colgan's Cut on the Curra and that the attack happened, that he, he began to hit her. Or he could have began to hit her before this maybe, but he stopped here and um she ran from the car they believe this is how you know her bits were were around the area and then obviously he caught up to her they believe that the rape and strangulation also happened here and that then she was moved to the mountains one of the men who answered uh one of the guardies questionnaires was 31 year old john Creerer. If you were watching the Operation Trace video that i done, you already know this name, and sorry because spoiler for this video then, but he was originally from Clock Jor Jordan in County Tipperary. He left school at the age of 14. He joined the army in 1966. He served for 13 years and uh, left or retired in 1979. He voluntarily left and his records say that he was exemplary. Exe exemplary. He was five foot seven with a fair complexion. After he left the army, he began working for provincial security services. And at the time in 1979, he was working as a security guard in the local Black and Decker plant. So in his questionnaire, obviously one of the typical questions was, do you know, like, do you know Phyllis Murphy? And John said no. And this caught the attention of the Gardaí because obviously through talking to the family or whatever, they must have been discussing people or something. I don't know how it came about. The family told the Gardaí that not only did he know Phyllis, they babysat for him when, he, when they were teenagers. So Phyllis and her other sisters had babysat when they were teenagers uh, for John and his wife. So in 1979, John his pregnant wife and their two kids lived in Woodside Park. And this was actually where Barbara Turner lived. They lived on the same road as far as I know or nearby. And so obviously she was the oldest. So by the time she was probably in her house and all, Phyllis and some of the other sisters were in their teens. And so they actually would babysit. So this caught the attention of Garda Kevin Duran. 
And so he actually wrote on the top of John's um, questionnaire. So he either wrote, because again, different sources kind of word it differently. So he either wrote, treat this man as a suspect, or he said, I would highly recommend that you like check this man's story out. This type of thing. He was basically highlighting the fact that they need to look into him more. Later on, um, Kevin Duran would actually say in that T.G. Cahar documentary that he did not do this lightly. When they questioned uh, John Creerer's movements, so he had been in um, Newbridge as well that day, shopping with his wife for the last Christmas bits. They then went home. On the way, he actually dropped a TV into the security hut in the Black & Decker plant for his like colleagues, or maybe for him later or something, and he gave them a tip on a horse. He then went home with his wife, obviously helped with like the messages or whatever, and then he headed down to McWay's pub for like a few drinks before work. It's amazing, like I'm sure people do it now as well, but it would be more frowned upon now. Whereas back then, it would, like that wouldn't have been a thing. Like I'm gonna go for like a few pints before I head off to work. At the pub, he ac- actually met uh, his colleague Paddy Bulger, who was also going to be on the eight pm shift that night at the plant. So whether they were there together, I actually think Paddy could have been there with his wife and family and stuff. So uh, they probably weren't together. I don't know. But anyway, the race that he had given his colleagues the tip on, that horse came second. So he actually ran the colleagues. I don't know whether it was the gloat or to say he was wrong. or something. I don't know which is second good if you give a tip. Um, and said jokingly, I don't think like I'm enjoying these Christmas points. I don't think I'm going to come in tonight. Paddy then left at around 6.30pm to go home and have dinner and John Carrera left around this time as well. So on the 16th of January 1980, two days before Phyllis would be found, Detective Sergeant Joseph Higgins and Detective Guard John Canney took a statement from John Carrera in Kildare Garda Station. And he basically said that he had been at work from 8pm that night until the following morning. His wife corroborated that he had been home uh, for tea or for dinner before going to work and his colleague Paddy Bulger also said that he was there for the 8pm shift. Paddy actually said that he arrived like kind of a couple of minutes after 8 and that John then arrived. Another colleague who was actually finishing a shift then, uh, Sean Phelan, also agreed with this, that they were both there. John Creer would admit to knowing uh, Phyllis's father and said that he would have also known her sister Patricia because she worked in the jet station. I'm guessing that's like a petrol station and said quote I cannot remember speaking to Phyllis Murphy in all my life you just nodded at her when she was babysitting so because of basically the alibis uh, provided by his wife Paddy Bulger and Sean Phelan John Quero was ruled out as a suspect Gardy took blood samples from 50 suspects in the area mainly they were men who just couldn't account for their whereabouts on that night um, and even though he had an alibi, they also asked John Creer on the 6th of March for a blood sample, which he gave. So at the time, these blood samples were basically only for exclusionary purposes. They couldn't match like the DNA or anything at the time. So it was really just to see what blood type it was. So there was blood obviously found on Phyllis. Now, obviously, all or most of this was hers. But for the slight chance that some of it could have been the killers, what they would do is they would check, you know, these 50 blood samples and, you know, whatever they were, they checked what the blood on her body was and see if they match. And if they don't match, they could exclude. So if 25 of them were a different blood type, then they could exclude them. But whereas the other 25 or whatever, if they matched blood types, that was all they could do. They couldn't then be like, well, it was you because it couldn't go any further than that at that stage. The semen samples and blood stain cards were kept securely in a filing cabinet in Nace Garda Station. And they were uh, kept under lock and key essentially by Christy Sheridan. In 1988, they would then be moved to Kildare Garda Station, again kept securely. And the key was with Finbar MacPaul. Phyllis's father, Michael, died in 1985, not knowing who was responsible for her death. Uh, Barbara would say that the family, that he, Michael just really didn't recover from this and that they would always be trying to like hide newspapers and stuff like that so that he couldn't read the details of her, her death and her assault. 
In the months after Phyllis's body was found, there would be 22,000 questionnaires done um, and there would be hundreds of interviews. In December 1980, so a year after she had gone missing, 20 new detectives were put on the case. They were led by our mate, Detective Superintendent John Courtney and Detective Inspector Gerard McCarrick. Now, I think it could, this could explain why. In January 1981, a farmer went into Clondalkin and Garda Station um, and I was wondering why he went to Clondalkin and Garda Station but John Courtney was actually based there for some of his career so maybe it was because he was there, that's why he, the farmer went there. But basically he said that shortly after Phyllis, uh, Phyllis disappeared, he saw a Datsun car near the Wicklow Gap. Now, John Creerer drove a Datsun, but he had an alibi. So, like, that was it. There was no, there were no other suspects, really. There was no arrests made and there was no progress with the case. Then, in 1997, Detective Inspector Brenda McArdle, who had been a guardie at the time and was involved in the search party for Phyllis, was working in the ballistics department <laughs> section in the Garda Technical, Technical Bureau. And this case had always been, you know, at the back of his mind. And he knew about av advances in DNA technology. So he decided to see if the samples were actually still stored and he was delighted to find that Finn Barr was keeping good track of them. So in July of 1997, he brought them to Dr. Marie, Maureen Smith of the State uh, Forensic Lab. And in January of 1998, she established that nine out of the 12 samples, uh, the semen samples, could get DNA. And how they used, how they done this was using the polymerase chain reaction, the PCR. So when I read this, I'm too excited about this. When I read this, I was like, oh, is that like PCR, like what we use like today? And it is. So it's basically when they use, when they take like a degraded sample of something and it this thing copies it like times a million and then it's large enough to sample like to use. So obviously when they stick that thing up your nose or whatever, they use a PCR then actually to, to make it bigger. That's what I'm guessing. But I did Google it and it did say that that's what the PCR test these days is also called. So there we go. Anyway, so they use this and that's how they were able to determine that nine of the samples would be able to be compared against something. So McArdle travelled to Oxfordshire to the Forensic Alliance Laboratory at Abingdon and he handed over the samples to scientist Matthew Greenhalgh. And so he obviously used the PCR thing to try and get the DNA samples done. And the following month, he had extracted a full DNA profile. So when this was all being done, there was no DNA database in the country. So it wasn't as simple as just like putting it in and hoping that you get a hit, that you needed something to compare it to. But they did have something to compare it to. They had the 50 blood saint cards. So uh, McArdle gave Matthew Greenhalgh 23 out of the 50 stain cards in September 1999. And unfortunately, there was no match. So then he gave the remaining ones to Greenhalgh in February 1999 and there was a match. Matthew Greenhalgh rang Brandon McArdle to say that one of the staying cards matched the DNA profile and the name on the staying card was John Creerer. I'm just going to read this bit out from the book and this would basically come, come down the road later but uh, Dr Maureen Smith would later conduct comparative analysis on the DNA profile. She would find that there was a 1 in 76 million chance that the DNA belonged to someone other than John Creerer. The following year, she carried out further tests using a more discriminating method of DNA and concluded that the chance of another person having the same DNA profile was 1 in 1,000 million. Just before 7.30am on Tuesday, the 13th of July, 1999, Three Gardaí pulled up in an unmarked car to Session Stud in Kildare, where John Creerer worked as a security guard. Detective Guard Mark Carroll approached him. He told him he was under arrest in connection with the murder of Phyllis Murphy. It's reported that his face, like just, there was no expression, like there was just the blood drained from his face. He didn't say anything as he got into the Garda car and went to the station. So he was taken to Nace Garda station and they basically told him like that his his the sample he had given back in 1980 
had matched with the semen taken from the body. But he just denied it. Like, he was like, no. They even then asked him to give another sample. And he did. They put the form in front of him and told him, like, you don't need, you don't need to give us it. If you don't want to, you don't have to consent. And he signed the consent form for them to take more uh, blood samples and uh, saliva samples. Down the hall, then, they brought in Paddy Bulger. And they told Paddy that the DNA from Phyllis's body now matched the blood sample given by John Creer. And he realised that he had given a false alibi for a murderer. He explained that John didn't arrive, John Creer didn't arrive until around 8.40pm on that night on the 22nd of December. He, he just assumed that he had left. So basically, I have to think that Paddy left at around half six. That's why I kind of said it earlier. He left around half six. He left the pub. John Creer must have still been there because he basically says that he thought that John just stayed in the pub longer and that that's why he was late. And he didn't want to get his colleague in trouble. So when they asked, he didn't think it was a serious thing. He, he didn't think he was a murderer. So he was like, no, yeah, no, he was here. The same as it would turn out that Sean Phelan, who had uh, just finished up his shift, had also lied. And his reason for lying was, you weren't supposed to leave a security guard on the road. It had to be two. And he left. So if he had said that John Creerer hadn't arrived, he would have been in trouble. So that's why he also lied. They both gave alibis for a murderer for like over two decades. So Paddy Bulger would say that he arrived around 8.40 p.m. Um, he pulled his car kind of like up to the security hut and said something about like he he said something like the battery or the motor or something fell out so he started like tinkering with it he pulled up the bonnet and started tinkering with it and stuff like that and then um left I was like I'm going down to O'Leary's I think he said to play darts and he left again so he left probably again before 9 p.m. and he came back uh like at 10 40 p.m like sat in the chair and fell asleep so Paddy just assumed that this was all true that he literally just went off and it could have been true because they kind of believe that he had enough time that, so he did leave the pub shortly around uh, half six around that time anyway because he dropped a friend Peter Rooney uh, home on the way to Maryville and he would have actually been pretty close to his house then in Woodside Park but he drove four miles out of his way to go to Newbridge so they believe obviously he picked up Phyllis obviously she knew him enough to get into the car and then like that whether he tried to subdue her in the car while they were driving whether he hit her or whether he just drove drove towards the car and was it only when they got there that she realized something was wrong and tried to get out and obviously what happened happened so the Gardaí, everything is kind of reported that he does actually leave then. Like he, he murders her there at the uh, Col Colgan's Cut. And that he then puts all the stuff back into the car, puts her into the boot and drives to the Wicklow Mountains. That he obviously leaves her there, places her there and then comes back and does go home. Because apparently he did actually go home for food. So his wife was technically telling the truth. She obviously didn't say about him being late for work though. Now, Paddy Boulder also said, uh, I read one article that said he wasn't wearing his uniform when he came. Now, would you not notice your husband wasn't wearing his uniform? So, I don't know, maybe he was, maybe he never did go home. I don't know, but she obviously said that he did. Anyway, they, they believe that he could have done this in the time and that that's why he would have been late at 8.40. Like, I don't know how long the assault and stuff in Galgan's cut took and then obviously he murdered her but I I don't know I wouldn't be surprised if she was in the car when he went when he went late to work because why would you leave again unless like that he really did go off to a to drink and play darts because I don't know you wanted to try get drunk to kind of go off those thoughts or something I don't know now I will say this case is very familiar to um, Mark Hennessy only a couple of years ago was drinking in uh, the south side of Dublin and he was out drinking 
And then he went off. He drove off and he abducted Jacine Valdez and he killed her. And then he returned to that pub and drank. So maybe that is actually what happened. Maybe he did kill Phyllis, went off and got rid of her body, came back and then was like, no, I'm going to go off and drink again. Maybe that I, that is how it happened. I always just kind of thought when I was reading it that I thought maybe she could have actually been in the boot when he was there originally. Uh, maybe that's even why he drove up and stayed beside the, the security hut with his car and then drove off. So obviously the new samples that John Creera gave matched and obviously then Maureen Smith as the developments went through by the time it went to trial she had those um statistics that she could give the trial took three years to go to court and it lasted four weeks so it went in October 2002 I'm not sure there's not a lot of talk about John Creer so I don't know he obviously testified though because there is a part where he says like he doesn't he doesn't know how the DNA matched because it, like he was basically saying like the DNA couldn't have matched it couldn't possibly be me I think that was kind of his argument like in 1999 maybe he truly didn't think maybe he didn't know the advances or something maybe he didn't because why would you give the sample again obviously then Paddy Bulger and Sean Feeling got up and said stuff the defense counsel obviously tried to be like will you lie back then like, are you lying now type of thing? That argument is always used. Sean Phelan, the security guard, told the court that within the two days since Phyllis went missing, so between the 22nd of December and 24th of December, he worked a day shift with John Creer. And that John Creer announced that he was going to wash his car. So he drove his car up near to the security hut. He told the lads that he was washing it because his wife spilled milk or something so that there was a horrible stench in the car um so there was no like hot water so he had to use the kettle and then a mop and a bucket and stuff to like scrub it out but he was scrubbing out the boot and stuff so like if your wife spilled milk inside because of the kids or something you know that would be inside the car like in the back seat or something you know where the kids were it wouldn't be in the boot you, the stench like I don't think the stench would be stuck in the boot if you wash the rest of the car maybe I'm wrong but you wouldn't have needed to wash your boot so in the court, um, guarded John McManus, he was actually one of the guardy to find Phyllis. He um, told the court that on July 27th, 1999, he and a colleague drove from the Black and Decker site to Kilcullen and on to Ballinagee to the location where Phyllis was found. The journey took 42 minutes and he kept under 50 miles per hour. At Ballinagee, he then removed a, sand, a bag of sand from the boot and carried it 10 yards off the road and covered it with branches. He then left the scene and retraced other steps that the prosecution alleged were taken that night, you know, obviously to Brannock's town and uh, Lockstown Upper and stuff like that. This entire trip, including all the stops and stuff, uh, McManus said took an hour and 35 minutes. So it would have fit into the time, obviously, um, before he arrived at work. So it could have been that. I still lean towards the other time. but I don't know. Obviously, none of us know. He won't talk. Martina McCormick, who was one of Phyllis's sisters, told the court that she, Phyllis, and another sister, Brida, used to babysit for the careers when they were teenagers. On the 31st of October, 2002, the jury of six women and six men had deliberated for eight hours over two days and they found him guilty of murder. The judge would obviously give the mandatory life sentence. Throughout the court, like, he was, uh, Creer was very much like, he wouldn't, he didn't stand when the judge came in and stuff like this. Even when the uh, verdict came in, he just sat with his eyes, with his head down, his eyes closed. One of his daughters screamed, oh, Jesus, from the back of the room. And apparently at this point, he like put his hand over his face. The Murphy family were actually brought um, up. I think it could have actually been the Conway bus operator again. Brought them up, you know, up and down every day to the trial. They attended every day of the trial, except for when Professor John Harbison gave his evidence on the postmortem, which would have obviously... Um, given details they just didn't they didn't want to and couldn't hear it they obviously left them that day happy not happy but like happy that justice had finally been served her brother Jared basically said like there's no way 12 people can argue with DNA so the Murphy family left uh the court 
followed by Carmel Creerer, better known as Betty, who was being supported by her her um sisters, her sisters, her daughters. Sorry, by this point, John had five children, so I think she was being supported. You know, like held up by her um daughters, and I believe his sons kind of walked him to like the the prison van or whatever. The Murphy family did say like they empathized with the career of family like they said it must be very it must be very hard on them you know like you don't choose who your father is paddy bulger would actually later um pass like a, a letter or a note to the murphy family apologizing for for the lie that he told and they basically said that they didn't they didn't hold him responsible like they didn't blame him so during the operation trace um, investigation obviously I brought up John Clearer in that video because um, they did look at him as a suspect for those ones um, particularly because when Phyllis became a part of that investigation they were looking through the questionnaires and uh, Pat Byrne the commissioner um, saw the note on John Clearer's one written by Kevin Duran you know that said about the um you know, treat this man as a suspect or, you know, be sure to check this man's story. And he said, like, why did he write this here? And so the, the detectives said, uh, like, I don't know. And he said, we'll get down to Kildare Car Station and find out why. And so they went, like, straight away to find out why he done, why he done it. So there's a few part, parts now. Um, a couple of the books talk about this frozen blood and then lifers that mention other um, allegations against John Creerer. Obviously, we believe he could be involved in some of the missing women. But uh, when Kevin Dram is doing his, his questionnaires, he actually, you know, when calling to houses, there were three different allegations uh, people made against John Creerer. Now, apparently there had always been whispers of womanising. That's what one one of them said, right? But then it was like, no, that it was nearly that women were uncomfortable around him and stuff. So like when you say womanizing, it makes it sound like he was just having loads of affairs or something. Whereas I think it was more that he was inappropriate and he made women uncomfortable. But there were actual allegations of assault. So these are just allegations. Now, the victims apparently have uh, have never taken them back. They've never said they didn't happen. They were never actually officially reported or like no charges were brought anyway. He was never arrested for them. Um, I think partly out of fear, they never went forward with them. So I'm not I'm not saying these things happen. I'm saying that this is what some of the sources say were allegations or, you know, even just kind of like circumstantial stuff. So I'm going to read a few bits. So John Creer had no prior convictions. Um, he was not known to the Gardaí, but apparently like that. There was this kind of thing that he was a bit of a predator, which again, which a predator and a womanizer are so far apart. Like a man can be a bit of a dick because he's a womanizer, but like a man should be arrested if he's a predator. So there were three allegations of abuse at this time. One of them was still a minor. Uh, so these were put, these were actually, these claims were put to John Creer when he had been brought in, in 1980. And he basically said that they were liars. One of the allegations, he said that she was a liar. He said that as a teenager, he caught her stealing and that she then came on to him uh, and that, like, it, like, you know, so that he wouldn't, like, tell her parents or whatever it was or wouldn't report her. But he basically says, um, it, you know, there was a bit of kissing and feeling because she came on to him, but, like, certainly no, no abuse or assault. Well, if she's a teenager and you're in your 20s or 30s, that's not just okay. One woman says that she was 10 years old and uh, I don't know whether they're on a holiday or what it was, but basically John Creerer came to the, the door of his caravan. They must have been in a caravan park. And he told the, the girl that his wife wanted to see her. Um, once inside, once inside, he abused her. There's more details. I don't really want to go into it, to be honest. Um, but he, like, seriously assaulted her. He'd done this again when she was 15. And apparently he would give her money to keep quiet. And, uh, quote, he'd get mad because he she wouldn't let him go, like, the whole way. Another one um, of the allegations was that this, uh, I, I'm assuming she was a teenager then. She was babysitting for them. 
and that she was staying over and she woke to find him in the bed with her and that he was like touching her and stuff and she says that she said if he didn't stop and get away from her she was gonna scream and wake his wife the third one said that he tried to sexually assault her in her home and that she grabbed a knife and said that if he didn't get away she was going to stick it in him now in 1979 earlier in the year i'm not sure what month uh, he was the DJ, it seems to be, in a dance for a dance in the artillery officer's mess. Now, I believe by this point he was no longer in the in the army. He was just there or whatever as the DJ. So apparently he was seen going upstairs where a woman was later then violently assaulted. I'm assuming it must have been dark or something because she says she couldn't identify him. But when she screamed, people came to her, uh, like her rescue or her aid, and um, that this person jumped out the window. And when they looked, there was actually a car below, and there was like a dent in the roof, so they obviously fell onto the roof. And it was said that Creerer was then limping in the days after this. So he was actually the prime suspect for this, but that there was no evidence to, to bring it further. Psychological profilers do say that killers will have a history of like, you know, there'll be like stalking and then sexual assault, my, like not minor offences obviously, but they, they don't just skip to murder. There's always like different bits of stalking, then like assault, even I think like, um, what's the word? Like peeping toms, you know, like they'll, they'll be like uh, peeping into neighbours' windows and, stuff like that, and then it, it eventually escalates to the point where it's like assault, sexual assault, rape, murder, that they never just jump to murder. The same as when we spoke about Larry Murphy, um, we know that he raped and murdered that woman, or tried to murder that woman. Sorry, thankfully didn't. But again, that's that's the whole discussion that like he, for him to have just jumped to doing that if if he had never done something before. And experts say that you know when they do do things like this, that it's only a matter of time then until they do escalate to full blown murder. Apparently, throughout the time, like the 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 twenty years or whatever until he was arrested, he was like. Like, everybody suspected him. Everybody thought it could be him. And, like, women were afraid of him. People didn't want to be around him. People didn't want to be near, like, you know, close to him and stuff like that. Now, speaking of Larry Murphy. John Creer worked as a security guard at the Aga, Gar Aga Khan stud. Um, Aga Khan is who owned um, Shergar. Remember Shergar went missing? Abducted. Um, so that's who Aga Khan is. It was there, like, stud farm or whatever, and he was a security. And apparently there was, like, a disused quarry behind the stud or something like that. And so, um, in one of the books, Frozen Blood, Frozen Blood, uh, a woman claims that she saw John Creerer there several times at the quarry. And that, like, she's seen him digging or lighting fires and stuff like that. And that she once seen him inside the gates of the quarry with, quote, a fresh-faced young man. And when she was showing photos of Larry Murphy, obviously back, you know, later then, um, she said that he did bear a, a close resemblance to that. Another woman said that on the night or the day after, the night after, uh, Deirdre Jacob went missing in 1998. She was the last of the, like, uh, missing women of the 90s. Um, that she woke at around 3 a.m. to, like, blood curdling screams like she said it sounded like someone in 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 pain um she says that at the time she kind of convinced herself that it was you know that it was just an animal or something uh, but like reflecting back on it she knows she knows that what she heard was a person i'm actually just going to read the quotes from the book from those two women so the first one he used to drive by here regularly. Most women in the area were terrified of him because of his reputation and the fact that he was known as the prime suspect for the murder of Phyllis. There is a disused quarry at the back of the stud and I saw him going in there on many occasions. It was sometime around midnight and I saw the vehicle that he drove at the time parked outside the gates of the quarry. The headlights were on and the gates were slightly ajar. He must have been in the quarry. It sent a shiver up my spine because it was the night after Jojo Dollard had disappeared from Moon Village. I told a friend, but we were too scared to do anything about it. Sometime later, my friend did report it to the Gardaí, but this quarry was never searched. I don't 
think that quarry has ever been searched. Not that I can find any news or updates on it. And then the other one on the night of Deirdre Jacobs' um, disappearance. So the night of, or at the latest, the night following the disappearance of Jacob, uh, Deirdre Jacobs, she was awoken at 3 a.m. or around that time. It seemed to go on for ages and then stopped. I was at the time a very heavy sleeper and it would take a lot to wake me. It was a horrible sound, like someone being tortured. I know the quaddy well, having played there as a child and the screams were coming from the wooded section not far from my house. I am sure it was getting bright when I fell back asleep. I told myself that what I heard could have been the cries of an animal, but I am now convinced that they were that of a human. And then months later, um, her and the neighbours apparently noticed a stench coming from the quarry. I'm not really sure. Because if you bury someone in a large place like that, would there be a smell? Or would it be more if you were to burn a body, would there be a smell? I'm not really sure. Do you know? Let me know. So, these type of killers, uh, like sexually derived killers sexual assault killers um they won't stop they can't they can't stop i think i said this in the larry murphy video before that that's what it, you know if profile i said they cannot stop it is it is like a drive in them to do this and the only way they can stop is if they are killed or if they like are imprisoned uh, maybe or if they become too old i don't know but all the disappearances and stuff stopped after John Creer was arrested in 1999 and Larry Murphy was arrested in 2000. There is a memorial um, stone at the place where uh, Phyllis was found up at Balanagy Bridge. Um, I will put up a picture for you to see it. I'm just going to read another bit by, so this is Frozen Blood, Serial and Psycho Killers in Ireland and it's by Michael Sheridan. I'm just going to read another bit kind of just kind of on reflection, I suppose. Um, so basically, like, John Queer just denies that he'd done it. I don't think he's ever spoken about it since then. John Queer was in Arbor Hill Prison, along with Larry Murphy. Um, he was described as quiet and a model prisoner. He actually apparently was physically threatened when he kind of first went in. Um, by other prisoners and stuff like that but um, as time went on he just kind of got into the thing apparently they were kind of saying like because because he was in the army he would have done better in prison because he's used to like the the regime and you know like a strict like being strict and all this stuff whereas someone who's never had that background would struggle more going into prison I think that was in the TG Cahar documentary so he worked in uh, the carpentry room or workshop or whatever alongside Murphy because that's what he done as a career so it's interesting that they both done that but did they know each other there's no kind of reports on interaction like it's interesting you would think if there was uh like other prisoners would like report on it no you know how sometimes you'll hear like prisoners being like oh like she was in there and this happened or you know or these got along well like I know um Myra Hindley and Rose West, Rosemary, Rosemary West, Rose West, Rosemary West, yeah, uh, apparently they were like mates in, uh, in prison, but that would have been other prisoners that, and obviously prison guards that were kind of reporting that out, like they were mates, but apparently then there was rumours of them being lovers, but, uh, so yeah, I'm surprised nothing has kind of seeped out with Murphy and Creer, but anyway, Creer has never really, seems to have talked about it so he's never kind of really acknowledged one way or another like he's not he's not shown remorse because he's just not kind of dealt with it, it talked about it whereas Murphy was obviously caught so Murphy has to say something like he and now apparently he's never shown remorse but he has to say like I don't know why I done it I don't know why I snapped like he has to give a reason whereas Creer was just like I didn't do it so anyway that's sorry what I'm reading here so uh, Murphy claimed that he committed the crime on impulse. He said that when he saw the girl, he just flipped. When questioned why he had put the woman in his own car and driven off, he remarked, I don't know why I did. And this is what uh, Mark Nash kind of done. Mark Nash kind of didn't, uh, remember from the Grange Gorman murders, he didn't give kind of any um, any reasons either. Like, So it says, this, as experts attest, is a blatant lie to give the impression that the motivation for the abduction was in some way random. 
but his lack of remorse is a truth. Studies of the basic psychology of psycho killers, along with their own testimony, consistently arrive at one conclusion. The absence of remorse kicks in with the repetition of sex killing. In 99% of these killers, the first crime produces fear, revulsion and remorse, which is kind of why I was saying that uh, like Carrera could have went drinking. Like if that was his first murder, he could have went drinking. The same as that might be why Mark Hennessy went back to the pub afterwards, this type of thing. Even Ted Bundy, one of America's most prolific and notorious serial killers, expressed horror and remorse after his first planned attack on a potential victim. He was a voyeur and liked to watch young women undress. One evening in the night in the summer of 1973, while drinking heavily, Bundy spotted a woman leave a bar and walk up a dark street. He followed her and found a piece of wood in a vacant parking lot and stalked her. He got ahead of the girl and lay in wait. How'd you get ahead of them on a street? He lay in wait before she reached the point where he was and turned to go into a house. He later described himself as horrified by the recognition that he had the capacity to harm another individual. Sorry, so he actually didn't kill her there. Um, he said he was seized with disgust, repulsion and fear at why he was allowing himself to attempt such extraordinary violence. But his compulsion was too great and he went on to murder over 29 women. After the first two or three murders, the remorse and revulsion were replaced by an addiction. Bundy, like most serial killers, could not stop. And this is the whole thing of like, they can't stop until they're, until they're stopped one way or another. <sighs> That's it, I think. I feel like there was a lot in this one and I hope I didn't forget anything. I know I say that every time, but there is always stuff and I always hope I don't forget stuff. Hi everyone, uh, future me from uh, the following morning and I'm editing. I'm also starting to get sick I think. Uh, <clears throat> sorry but I just realised that I actually never spoke about John Queer is coming out of prison. So as of now I believe he's still in prison. There are news articles from last uh, year 2021 of like the, the Murphy family saying that he wouldn't be welcome back in Kildare, this type of thing. And it does say that he's due for release shortly. Um. As of 2022, he has basically served 20 years, which is obviously on the higher end of the life sentence. So I would believe he's coming out soon. There has never really been mentioned about his family, if they have kind of stood by him, have they been visiting him? I'm not sure. So whether he would go back to the family home in Woodside Park, I don't know, because to be honest, it's quite close to uh, Barbara Turner's house. Barbara Turner does say like that they would still see his family out and stuff like that. And obviously it's quite uh awkward you know like that but um uh, yeah as the family did say they don't they they don't hold anything against the career of family they know it must be uh, very hard on them anyway yeah sorry i don't know i kind of have a feeling that this was probably his first one and that like that it was a progression that he had done these other things you know um that he was alleged to have done uh, minor things that led to sexual assaults, that led to rape, that led to murder. And that once he murdered Phyllis Murphy, then that was it. Especially if you think you didn't get like caught. Like after a couple of years, then you'd be like, I'm in the free. Like I got away with that. And you would do it again. And I always think, I know I'm going to discuss them, but I always think Antoinette uh, Smith and uh, Patricia Doherty were found they were murdered and found and their murders are unsolved but they were found and then the women that was kind of the late 80s into the 90s and then uh the rest of the 90s they're never found and I always think that I always feel like there's connections between these and it's like Phyllis was Phyllis was found and then those other the other women were found but then they weren't and like they learn killers learn they they develop they uh they develop they evolve, they like they grow, they learn. And so they knew then that those places were too easy to find them. And then the next ones were never found. Again, that's just speculation. That could just be me. Um, Let me know what you think. Let me know if you think it could have just been a once off. And why do you think he done it? I feel like maybe you would like to think, well, you would like to think, you would think maybe that he was just giving her a lift and like that, the his little impulses for like sexual assault or whatever came over him. Maybe that's all he was going to try to do and the panic then led to the murder. But then why did he go out of his way to go to Newbridge in the first place? 
you know, like had he decided he wanted to do something. Now, he could have decided that he just wanted to like that sexually assault a girl and then came upon Phyllis who he knew and thought it could have been an easy one maybe. Um, because bear in mind, he knew those other those other girls, like the one who was babysitting for him and the one in the caravan park and all, he knew them. So it wasn't like he was afraid to do it to someone he knew that it had to be a stranger. So could it have been a case that he'd done it, he attacked Phyllis or was go that was the plan that he was going to like, you know, sexually assault her or something like that. But, you know, she got out and it kind of got to a point where he had to kill her. I don't know. But that's kind of what I would think could have been how it happened. And then once he done it, like the whole thing with him, but once you do, once he done it, once you done it, once they do it, they have to do it again. They have to keep doing it. And I think, I do think that that's it. I do think that this is connected to Operation Trace. But let me know what you think, please. Let me know what you think of my background. I'm trying to get better at the L things. Um, the little backgrounds. And I started out so hopeful in this video. i done my makeup for the first time in so long. And I straightened my hair. I actually straightened my hair and it was straight. But it's raining on and off and still it is so hot. Like I'm, I'm sweating. So most of the makeup is sweated off. It was orange to begin with. And my hair is just poofy. And for some reason this side goes poofier than the other. But anyway, first world problems. Uh, once, uh, like as usual, I hope you're all safe. Um, I am still trying these mini videos in between. So if you have a good mini video suggestion, please let me know. I have an interesting one coming up. Um, and obviously I'm doing these cases. These ones are taking a while longer because I'm trying to get as much information. So if there's documentaries and books and news articles and everything else, I'm really trying to get everything before I do it because I don't want to do it and then be like oh my god there was another this because that has happened before where I'm like how did I not know there was another book on this or how did I not know you know there was this and I'm like damn it so anyway yeah that's kind of it uh yeah I hope I'm not forgetting anything yeah I'm hoping this will be out before Monday so let's let's wish you all a lovely week before we do that um, yeah, anyway, take care and we shall see you in the next video. Thanks.